So let's talk about carbohydrates as we begin the second module of this course. So here's a video that you could look at that sort of supplements this lecture. First of all, unlike amino acids where you only have 20 amino acids to make all these different types of proteins, thousands to hundreds of thousands of proteins, carbohydrates are different. You have a vast and diverse array of carbohydrates. So they could be monosaccharides, such as your simple glucose and fructose. Uh, they can be a little bit more complicated when they uh, become polysaccharides, in which case the sugars have formed a bond with other sugars. We have disaccharides and polysaccharides, which are more than two sugars joined together. Carbohydrates in general just have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So this is what we call the empirical formula. And we build upon this unit. Again, referring to the diverse and complexities of monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides, you can take a sugar and do all sorts of oxidations and reductions to that sugar. This is where we get the highly derivatized uranic acid, deoxy sugars that are found in DNA, uh, amino sugars. A lot of these sugars are conjugated to proteins. Sugars are a central hub for metabolism. Think of glucose. And the list goes on and on. A lot of sugars are also on the surface of a cell where they can be attachment sites for hormones or even toxins. Continuing on, monosaccharides are joined together. We actually define the bond. So referring back to amino acids, you join amino acids together with a peptide bond. So that's the unit that holds together proteins. So the type of bond and unit that holds together polysaccharides is called the glycosidic bond. And that's an important point uh, that we will discuss. So we actually define the type of glycosidic bond the polysaccharide has. And then finally, in terms of metabolism, uh, monosaccharides are the main point where a lot of our cells derive their energy. So glucose is the most famous example, but we can also metabolize fructose and other types of sugars as well. Galactose also is one of them. So as mentioned before, sugars will be joined together via a glycosidic bond. We actually define the type of bond also. So we just say, going back to proteins, peptide bond. Okay, that's it. That's all done. A little bit more complicated with a glycosidic bond. So, for example, take for instance sucrose, which is nothing more than table sugar. Uh, sucrose is glucose and fructose joined together, but it is actually glucose joined together with an alpha-1, beta-2 glycosidic bond with fructose. So, basically, the alpha anomer of glucose, we will define anomers, uh, makes a bond with a beta anomer of fructose. So sucrose is nothing more than glucose alpha 1 beta 2 fructose. So we have to be more specific in terms of the glycosidic bond. Its definition is based upon the anomer, an alpha anomer of the sugar or a beta anomer of the sugar. So in this case, we have to define an anomer and we will do that in our next slide. I'm going to spend a lot of time here on this particular slide, and I'm going to purposely go slow. Uh, first thing I want to mention is um, all of these are Fisher projections. It's the type of representation. In no way does an actual sugar look like this. And the second point is highlighted in the red boxes. So that CHO is the aldehyde moiety. So the aldehyde group is just a functional group that is C double bond OH. So all you see here are aldehydes. So glyceraldehyde is the simplest uh, aldehyde. And um, basically, as we build HCOH units, we build and build and build and build HCOH units. Eventually, uh, the book stops at six. Here we have the almighty glucose. Um, so these are aldehyde sugars, but we don't call them aldehydes. We call them aldoses. So what we see here are aldoses. So for example, let's take a look at glucose, which we will study uh, in terms of metabolism later on in the course. Glucose has six carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six. 
So glucose is not only a hexose, hexa means six, but it is also an aldose. So glucose is an example of an aldose hexose, an aldehyde sugar that is six carbon. Let's take a look at ribose. Ribose uh, found in RNA is five carbons, one, two, three, four, five. So five carbons would make this a pentose, penta being five. So ribose is an aldose pentose. The second main point here is um, we're just adding HCOH units. Okay, those are highlighted in these yellow squares on these Fisher projections. So we depict these as Fisher projections, as you've learned in organic chemistry, just to make visualization easier. Because in reality, uh, these sugars are not linear and they're not flat as depicted in a Fisher projection. In fact, they're very much three-dimensional entities with a three-dimensional structure. Let's take a look at ribose just as an example. So here we have this aldehyde carbon. That's number one. Here we have carbon number two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five. So carbon number one is not chiral. Okay, so the double bond does not make it chiral. Carbon number two is chiral. Carbon number three is chiral. Carbon number four is chiral. Carbon number five is not chiral. So we will define an anomeric carbon as the carbon uh, that is not chiral, but suddenly becomes chiral when this molecule forms a ring. So you see most of these sugars, as you see them in your biochemistry textbook, are not really flat Fisher projections. Okay, so I've built a glucose molecule here. I really don't know if you can see this in the poor webcam resolution, but this is the glucose molecule, a six carbon ring structure. So in this ring structure, um, this aldehyde carbon, which was once not chiral, achiral, when this forms a ring, such as depicted here, that carbon actually suddenly becomes chiral. So here, and again, I do not know if you can see this, but here, this carbon uh, used to be the aldehyde carbon. Now it has become chiral. So when this sugar molecule, or any of these molecules shown here is glucose, when this sugar molecule undergoes an intramolecular cyclization, that is when it forms a ring and does a nucleophilic attack on itself, the carbon now that was formerly not chiral becomes chiral. And that is the definition of an anomer. An anomer carbon is a carbon that is not chiral, but upon ring formation, intramolecular, nucle uh, nucleophilic intramolecular attack, as a part of the ring formation, it becomes chiral. So in all these aldoses, carbon number one serves as the anomeric carbon. All right, so the important point here is carbon one is the anomeric carbon for all aldoses. These are aldose sugars. Now, the next point I want to talk to you about is stereochemistry. So depicted here are all D sugars. That is the stereochemistry. And the stereochemistry is really determined by the car chiral carbon. It's very important here. It's determined by the chiral carbon farthest away from the anomeric carbon. So once again, stereochemistry, whether this is D or L, is determined by the chiral carbon that's farthest away from the anomeric carbon. Well, we know that the anomeric carbon for all aldoses is carbon number one. So let's see, again, looking at our ribose example, what carbon is farthest away from the anomeric carbon yet still is chiral. So here's our anomeric carbon. So that's carbon one, anomeric. Carbon two, Carbon three, it's chiral, chiral. Carbon four, chiral. Carbon five is not chiral. So what determines stereochemistry is the OH that is attached to carbon number four, four ribose. Also arabinose, xylose, and lyxose. Let's look at glucose. What carbon and the OH group substituent attached to it 
determine stereochemistry. All right, so here's carbon number one, which is anomeric and not chiral. Remember, the anomeric carbon is will be chiral when this forms a ring. So that's carbon one. Carbon two, chiral. Carbon three, chiral. Carbon four, chiral. Carbon five, chiral. Carbon six, not chiral. So for glucose and all the hexoses, it is carbon number five that determines the stereochemistry, particularly that OH group attached to it. So now we know that the carbon and the OH that is attached to it determines the stereochemistry. What makes it D or L? Well, if the OH group that is attached to the carbon, in this case carbon number five for glucose, carbon number four for ribose, in this case carbon number three for ruthrose and threose, if that OH group attached to that chiral carbon is pointing to the right in the Fischer projection, if it's pointing to the right in the Fischer projection, then you have a D sugar. Now say for instance this OH is pointing in the Fischer projection along the left. If it's pointing to the left along the Fischer projection, you have an L sugar. Again, it's determined by the OH attached to the chiral carbon farthest away from the anomeric carbon. Okay, so it's not carbon number five or carbon number six. It's not that terminal carbon because the terminal carbon is not chiral. So epimers are defined as um, the stereochemistry along all chiral carbons is the same except one. So let's look at glucose and mannose. So in your mind's eye, if you can superimpose glucose and mannose together, if you superimpose these two Fischer projections together, you will see that this CHO, CHO lines up. So I want you to mentally visualize joining these two Fischer projections, glucose and mannose, and sort of merging them in your eye. So the CHOs line up. The HCH does not line up with the HCOH. They don't line up. The OHCH lines up with the OHCH. The HCOH lines up with the HCOH. The HCOH carbon number five lines up with the HCOH. And then finally the CH2OH lines up with the CH2OH. So everything lines up except for chiral carbon number two. So we will call glucose and mannose C2 epimers, C2 epimers, that is what glucose and mannose are. So let's um, extend this example. How about glucose and galactose? So glucose and galactose. Okay, so in our mind's eye, we're going to superimpose these Fischer projections and see which one is off in terms of their stereochemistry. So glucose and galactose. So let's start off with glucose first. The CHO lines up with the CHO. The HCOH lines up with the HCOH. The OHCH lines up with the OHCH. The HCOH does not line up with the OHCH. The HCOH, carbon number five, lines up with the HCOH. And CH2OH, not a chiral carbon, will always line up with CH2OH because those, those are not chiral. So, we have glucose and galactose are going to be C4 carbons. So the stereochemistry here's the same, here's the same, here's the same, here it's different at carbon number four. So glucose and galactose are C4 epimers, C4 epimers. Finally, glucose, which is again what we all know as the central nucleus with regards to glyco uh, glycolysis and metabolism, uh, glucose actually has, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven isomers. Seven isomers. Actually, those are seven D isomers. Okay, with that, we will also include the seven L isomers. So glucose has about 14 different isomers. All right, 14 different isomers, one of which is D glucose. So we have at the very minimal, 14 different ways to arrange the formula of glucose, which is C6H12O6. All right, now let's talk about not aldoses, but ketoses. Okay, we're going to begin with the simple 
ketose, that is dihydroxyacetone. And again, because these are sugars, we will not call them ketones, but we will call them ketoses. And like before, okay, this is pretty much similar to the previous slide, we will just add HCOH units. Okay, HCOH units, HCOH units. And let's focus here on this famous sugar, famous ketose, that is fructose. So fructose is one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six carbons. Fructose is a hexose ketose. Okay, six carbon sugar it also is a ketose. These are Fisher projections, and Fisher projections are just a way of visualization and representation of these monosaccharides. In no way, shape, or form do they represent what's happening in three dimensions because these are flat. And real sugars, as you see here in glucose, uh, are three-dimensional entities. We have to determine the anomeric carbon. So if you remember in the previous slide, the anomeric carbon was C1. Here, it's going to be C2. So the anomeric carbon for ketoses is carbon number two. So what carbon determines the stereochemistry? Once again, it is the chiral carbon that is farthest away from the anomeric carbon. So here we have uh, CH2OH, let's pick on fructose here, CH2OH, <coughs> which is not chiral. This is chiral, this is the anomeric carbon. It will become, uh, this is achiral, but will become chiral when this forms a ring, hence the definition anomeric carbon. This is chiral, this is chiral, this is chiral, this is not chiral. The carbon farthest from the the chiral carbon farthest from the anomeric carbon determines stereochemistry. For fructose, that's going to be carbon number one, two, three, four, five. Carbon number five determines its stereochemistry. More specifically, the OH that is attached to that carbon, and that OH is on the right-hand side. Remember, in a Fisher projection, if the OH is on the right-hand side, we have a D stereochemistry. Okay, if the OH is on the left-hand side, we have L stereochemistry. So basically we will have a ring formation. So what's happening in glucose, what's happening in fructose is essentially um, the OH from this carbon that determines the OH bound to this carbon that determines stereochemistry does nucleophilic attack on the anomeric carbon. Okay, that carbon on this carbonyl group is electrophilic. The OH attached to carbon number five is weakly nucleophilic. We're forming a ring here. This pair of electrons from the double bond goes to become a lone pair on the oxygen, and that lone pair captures an H+. Okay, actually, that H+, originally was the H that was here. So the net effect is that you're going to have a ring formation. This happens in fructose. This happens in glucose. Okay? And that is something we will talk about in our next slide. By the way, the carbon that determines stereochemistry in ribulose, again, the carbon farthest away, that is chiral. So one, two, this is the anomeric carbon, subject to nucleophilic attack. Three, four, five, five is not chiral. So carbon number four determines stereochemistry. And the OH substituent is bound to the right. It's a D sugar. In fact, all of these are D sugars. All right, so what's happening here? Um, the carbon that determines stereochemistry, that OH does nucleophilic attack on this carbon. This pair of electrons goes here, and as stated before, we pick up that hydrogen, which is basically that hydrogen here. This OH does nucleophilic attack. This OH uh, goes here, and one of the lone pairs of the hydrogen, one of the lone pairs of the oxygen, excuse me, attaches and binds to the hydrogen. That hydrogen originally was from here. Okay, that's called tautomerization. Now, what you see in textbooks is the Hayworth projection. Okay, the Hayworth projection. If you're talking about cyclohexane, six carbon sugars, such as glucose, uh, you can also do another visualization, and that is the chair. So that's uh, what you do when you build a uh, cyclohexane. You get the chair formation. So the chair can have the substituents that are axial, where they're pointing up, or they can have it where the substituents bound to the carbon are equatorial. 
and sort of facing the equator, okay, facing the sides. So we often have ring flips in cyclohexanes, and glucose is a cyclohexane. Say so ring flip, ring flip, okay. Axial, some substituents, and now the axial substituents become equatorial, okay. Once again, axial substituents, those substituents that are pointing up and down, ring flip. Now those axial substituents via the ring flip have become equatorial. So there's three representations of cyclohexane, okay, of which glucose is a six carbon closed ring. There's the Fischer projection, there's the Hayworth projection, and what the six carbon glucose or hexose really looks like, and that is uh, this chair formation where the substituents are either pointing up uh, axial or pointing equatorial. Okay, so we have ring flips. Okay, that only occurs in the six carbon cyclohexanes. As you can see here, again, probably a very poor visualization on the camera, my webcam, but this is a ring flip. All right, so we're going to do this intramolecular nucleophilic attack one more time. Once again, that OH attaches to the carbon. This pair of electrons goes here. That pair of electrons that went to oxygen picks up that hydrogen. And now, couple of things happen. You're going to get an OH. If that OH is above the plane in the Hayworth projection ring, we call that the beta anomer. Okay, so remember carbon number one here is chiral, whereas carbon number one here in the linear projection is actually achiral. So see the uh, thing that's happening here. Carbon number one is now chiral. Okay, so the OH is one unique substituent. That oxygen is a second unique substituent. That hydrogen is a third unique substituent. And all this other stuff is the fourth unique substituent attached to this carbon number one. Whereas this carbon number one is not chiral because of the double bond. So this chiral carbon here was achiral here. That in very essence is the definition of an anomeric carbon. So carbon number one is the anomeric carbon, it's chiral. And that OH substituent is above the plane of the ring. We call that the beta anomer. Very, very important um, what I'm mentioning to you about here. This is the beta anomer of glucose. We can do the exact same thing here with fructose. This OH is going to do a nucleophilic attack. It's a weak nucleophile. Picking up uh, this pair of electrons goes to oxygen. That pair uh, on oxygen goes to pick up the hydrogen and we get an OH that's above the plane of the ring, beta form of fructose. Okay. So uh, what you see here in the middle is the hemiacetal intermediate for our glucose because it's an um, aldose and a hemiketal intermediate for fructose because it's a ketose. So if the OH is above beta glucose and it's D, why is it D? Okay, what carbon determines the stereochemistry? It's carbon five. And what is attached to that carbon number five, this carbon, carbon six, is above the plane of the Hayworth projection ring. So if the carbon uh, that determines stereochemistry, if that substituent that's attached to it is above the plane of the ring, that's the D form of the Hayworth projection. Now, what happens if that carbon, CH2OH, is below, okay? If that CH2OH is below, that is the L form of beta glucose. So two things that are going on here. One, when this forms a ring, if the OH is above, that's the beta anomer, because this is the anomeric carbon to which the OH is attached to. That's the beta anomer. If the OH is below the plane of the Hayworth projection ring, it's the alpha anomer. Second, this is D because that CH2OH attached to the carbon that determines stereochemistry is above the plane of the ring. We call that the D form. If that CH2OH is below the plane of the ring, where this H is, if that CH2OH is below the plane of the ring, we have the L form. You can have a beta D glucose, you can have an alpha D glucose, you can have a beta L glucose, you can have an alpha L glucose, okay, depending upon where um, the OH is attached in the 
Hayworth projection above or below, and dependent upon where the CH2OH is attached above or below. Remember that determines stereochemistry. All right, let's focus now on glucose. So 36.4% of glucose is in the alpha form, where the OH attached to the anomeric carbon is below the ring. And a vast majority of it is 64% is above the plane of the ring. And then very small abundance is actually 1% or so is in the linear form. So that 1% or so of the linear form glucose when this interchanges will be very important as we will see in our next lecture. So beta form is actually a little bit more stable. And why is it a little bit more stable? Uh, it's a little bit more stable, again, because in the beta form, all of the OH substituents, I know this is hard to see, but um, all the OH substituents are actually equatorial. Okay, so remember, for cyclohexanes, we can have ring flip. Okay, so here I'm demonstrating ring flip. The, it, literally, it's the cyclohexane, the six carbon cyclic ring is flexing, okay? It's flexing. Now, in this flex, all of the OHs, in this flex, in this ring flip, all of the OHs are equatorial, okay? All of the OHs are pointing not up or down, but they're pointing to the equators, the sides. And that is the beta form, which is the reason why it is most naturally abundant, okay? The H's are actually axial. They're pointing up and down, which again is thermodynamically the most stable because the OH is pointing towards the equator. Our equatorially, substituents, the way they're situated, minimize hysteric attraction. So the reason why beta is mostly uh, most stable and 64% or so natural abundance has to do with looking at this not in the Fisher projection form, not in the Hayworth projection form, uh, looking at it in terms of the chair form, which is what actually these look like. Okay, And in the chair form, the beta glucose, the substituents are all equatorial. So if you follow the mouse pointer, this is pointing towards the equator, this is pointing towards the equator, this OH is pointing towards the equator, this OH is pointing towards the equator, and this OH is pointing towards the equator. Very nice, these small hydrogens are pointing up and down and away from each other. This is the way to get everything away from each other, and henceforth the beta form is sort of like this select form of glucose. And maybe the reason why we focus, or our bodies focus uh, on it being the main form of energy and the main form of nutrition and the main form of metabolism. All right, so a lot of chemistry is in there. So definitely you want to review this, you know, twice or thrice and look over uh, the PDF that I've also put in there about uh, the preliminary definitions. So anomers, epimers, uh, beta anomer versus alpha anomer. What determines stereochemistry, the L form or the D form? So quickly here, let's look at different forms of sugar. Okay, so uh, this is glucose, okay, um, the aldose sugar. But a lot of times we're going to see and we're going to be exposed to not just glucose, but gluconic acid. So oxidation of this anomeric carbon to the carboxylic acid, you get D-gluconic acid. You see a lot of these sugars in extracellular matrix. You see a lot of these sugars in uh, these um, derivatized sugars, that is. You see a lot of them in um, glycosaminos, glycans, proteoglycans, uh, a lot of matrix components. These are outside the cell. Uh, they interact a lot with collagen, really gives us a lot of flexibility and makes the um, tendons and ligaments more like um, shock absorbers. All right, how about this one here? Glucose gets oxidized to the carboxylic acid. This is D-glucuronic acid. Once again, D-glucuronic acid. We'll see this again when we talk about the extracellular matrix. A lot of derivatives of sugar. So not everything is glucose. Not everything is fructose. A um, lot of other sugars found in our metabolism and found in other components of our body. For example, maya and acetal, we will see, is found in a lot of lipids. Okay, Glycerol is sort of a building backbone for our lipids. Uh, ribose is seen in RNA. 
Okay, so glyceraldehyde, um, we're going to see that in glycolysis. So we're going to see these again. Okay, as a, a reason why we will see this again, how about um, DNA, okay, the part of DNA, uh, the sugar part, deoxyribose, okay, so why is this beta, okay, beta because that OH on the anomeric carbon is pointing up, why is it D, because the CH2OH is pointing up on the carbon that determines stereochemistry, and for riboses and ketoses, that's carbon 5, okay, pentoses. L, why is the sugar L? Because the CH3 is pointing down. Uh, this OH should be pointing down also. Alpha, this OH is down. That's a mistake in your textbook. But L, because the CH3 on this carbon is pointing down, that's L. The OH here is pointing down, will be alpha. What you see here is beta. So this is a mistake in your textbook. Amines, so amine sugars, again, um, we're going to see a lot of this in our future. Um, it's not 20 amino acids. It's not like, oh, I'll memorize the 20 amino acids and then I know how proteins are built. There's no way you could memorize all the individual units that make up a sugar and then we polymerize them to make polysaccharides and then they get thousands of sugars, very diverse. So here we have alpha D glucosamine. You can buy this at many nutrition stores. Uh, galactosamine. Um, these are the representations. All right, unlike the previous slide, uh, the OH is pointing down. Okay, so that's where we get our alpha. The OH is pointing down on the anomeric carbon. That's where we're getting our alpha. Why is this D? Look at the CH2OH and look at the CH2OH attached to the carbon number five, the carbon that determines stereochemistry. These are Hayworth projections. So, um, spoiler, we're going to see a lot of these in the future. You can buy a lot of these glucosamines. These are polymers, very negatively charged, give the extracellular matrix a sort of lubrication quality. Glycosidic bonds, so we can form sugars, we can form bonds with sugars and other chemical moieties. So here we have an O-glycosidic bond, so the hydroxyl group is forming a bond with the methanol and you have that OCH3 group that is an O glycosidic bond. In DNA and RNA we have N glycosidic bonds so we want to introduce glycosidic bonds. Uh, unlike peptide bonds we have to be more specific as to the type of anomer that the bond is um, making. So that is where we will get the alpha glycosidic bond if it's the alpha anomer that's forming the actual sugar bond or a beta glycosidic bond if the beta anomer is forming the actual sugar bond. So as an example, DNA and RNA. So here we have an N glycosidic bond. So here's the anomeric carbon. It's forming a bond with the nitrogen of the base, DNA or RNA. That's an N glycosidic bond.